LA is in a lot of ways a city of contrasts of just very different things existing side by side. For a lot of creatives that aren't from LA is they come here because it's a place of legend and lore and where other people have created amazing things and they come here to feel the energy of that creation. It was the place where it just didn't seem like there was any cap on your dreams. The biggest things in the world were always coming out of Los Angeles. In the beginning, I think LA felt really big. It can look very similar and, and superficial even in a way. I think a lot of people from the electronic music world where I come from are attracted to LA because there's this huge amount of possibilities. But when you're first here, that energy is just, you feel like you can do anything. You feel like you can become anyone or make anything possible. If you're willing to work, if you're willing to connect, it's a fantastic place to grow. It's a magical place if you really want to dive into it. The reason why Somebody Else is the opening song of the album is because the music feels like an intro to something that's coming. It feels like a perfect introduction to the music world of the album. I hear you moved out of the suburbs Well I hope you know I'm doing fine Musically is the song on the album that reminds me of LA from the 80s, or at least how I imagine it would sound or feel like. In the beginning, Somebody Else was supposed to be an instrumental, because I really liked the idea of having an instrumental song as an intro, but then I don't know, I felt like, oh, there could be more. I came across Boy Matthews a couple of times and I really liked what he was doing, so eventually we met in LA. I went to his house and we just kind of sat and just marinated in a bunch of different music and he already had a lot of the beat together, the instrumental together for somebody else and he just whipped out and he was like, I really love this, I was thinking maybe we could work on this and I was instantly like, oh my god, this is incredible. And I remember that we actually recorded somebody else in one afternoon. I know you wish it could have been us. In the room, I backed off, I heard this instrumental and I was like, love this, don't know what to do with it, but we're gonna figure it out. And I sat alone for a second and I think I just started talking to him about this conversation I'd had with my friend that morning. It's like relationships, sometimes they don't work out, but then afterwards you become kind of, you don't want to be, but you become fixated on what the other person is doing. And it's very easy to just bump into an ex or bump into somebody else that you didn't want to necessarily bump into. And I remember that morning she called me and she was just a little down. And that was the mood of the day for me personally. Like I kind of digested that and I was ready to talk about that when we got into the session. Somebody else, for me has two very different vibes because the music to me it feels uplifting there's a lot of energy and the singing style sounds happy but the lyrics are not really you know it's a sad happy sad love song or breakup song even We only met once, but it was super easy to, to work with him because he's such a great guy and it was very natural from, from the start, from the beginning.
That's what's kind of lovely thing about our collab as well, is that I feel like he knows what he wants and what he doesn't want, and it was lovely we could get in the room that day and just be on the same page in that way. I want to tell a story and what I'm also trying to do is maybe sometimes trick people into thinking that it's the simple electronic music but there's something behind below you know what what I'm trying to sneak in there When I started going out in Germany, I think that was around maybe 16, that was actually the rise of Acid House. The techno came up, big rave parties started. We had a big movement here in Germany back then. That was in the 90s. It was a super exciting time and I was very lucky to experience that. For me, that was a whole new universe. For my professional career, that was a really great foundation. I think that was it, you know, that was the moment when I fell in love with electronic music and I was like, I want to do something like this. You know, I had a drum machine, synthesizer, and I was just fiddling around. Absolutely not on a professional level, but I was doing electronic music as a hobby. That was the start of the journey, really. If you're into dance and electronic music, there's a mythology around these producer figures that are coming up. You're always looking for the new producers or the story that they're telling. And I think that's when I first started to pay attention to Ten Snake, is that Ten Snake fit in this narrative of emerging underground producer. As an artist, I find it really important to not stick to a certain genre, but also to make a statement. So I really try to make music that's timeless. I think Marco is an incredibly gifted producer. I think he is able to incorporate his influences in a way that few producers can. And, you know, he can just as easily make a, an 80s synth track as he can, you know, dark driving German techno. He's super diverse, but it's all electronic based. So he wants to give that touch to it, but he also wants to make sure that there is a feel to it. Once he's got the idea, he goes for it and he doesn't second guess himself. I think he sees things clearly for himself. I think he has a hard time articulating those things and he'd just rather show people. I put him in a category with European producers and composers like a Giorgio Moroder. For me, he's like of that school in the same sense that Maroder wrote for, you know, Blondie um, or, you know, Maroder wrote for Berlin um, and had huge success. I feel like that's his trajectory. I met Fiora back when I started working on my first album. And eventually we worked so much together that we ended up as a couple. We were writing for Gemini and we were just trying a whole bunch of different stuff. Night Shift was inspired by my mom, who was doing night shifts at the time when we were creating that track. With Night Shift, I'm always thinking about the opening lines. Which is half awake, hours pass me by. It's this, they're sung like they're half awake. Half awake staring at the wall. It's crazy, I've never met someone who's so in control and diverse. 
she can sing basically every style, you know, and it will sound great. For me, Night Shift um, is transporting a lot of great emotions and, and energy, even though it's so, you know, filtered and slow. The vocals would influence how the track went and everything would morph around all the other parts. And so, yeah, with Night Shift, it, it happened like that. LA, the album is a diary, really. So when I started working on it, I honestly had no plan. Most of the people in this scene, you may see that name come through and then you never hear from them again. But then there's artists that manage to have some consistency, keep producing, and basically showing the rest of the world that I have an ambition as an artist and as a producer beyond this subculture. We saw early on that Ten Snake wanted to go further, wanted to tell a bigger story, wanted to make albums, wanted to make popular music. I think in comparison to my first album, Glow, LA is daring a lot more towards entering the world of pop music, which is, in my opinion, also a result of being in LA. And so I feel like the album LA is just that. It's Marco's pop play. It's like he's made a pop record that sounds like LA that no one from LA could have made. Because the LA experience is about being an outsider trying to make it here, and he did it. For Marco, you know, he's the type of producer who always starts with the instrumentals. He starts with the music, and then he starts working with the top line writers and the vocalists. It's often not until he's pretty far down the road with those people that the identity of a song really starts to take shape. Never really over it. It keeps me up a bit Afraid of this reality So latching onto you is covering my love and soft spot for 90s R&B In the beginning, before pitching it to Ten Snake, it had a different feel and then it wasn't until we heard the first demo from Ten Snake and it just took us a completely different direction that we didn't know that it needed I feel like latching onto you Cause I'm not Nazarene's vocals it sounds very sensual, it's very emotional, also sexy in a way. I'm still not really over it. Don't know why it is so hard to split. I'm not ready yet to face my fears. So I'll run away. 
I think it's that really relatable moment in an ending of a relationship where you know you need to let go, you know it's kind of done, but it's really hard to do that. Not wanting to accept that it's over and going through those very human moments of just not wanting to accept reality. It was very deep, very different, very fresh and emotive. I was so happy with what he did to the track, how he interpreted the track and brought it to life. It's not every day that you're going to click the way that we clicked artistically. And I think we were able to tell a story successfully uh, because of that. All I do is run away. Run away, run away, run away. I really here to stay, here to stay. The way I see my music is it sits somewhere between club music and pop music. With the help of great vocalists and, and songwriters, I think I really achieved something on LA, which is bringing both worlds together. As a songwriter, as you kind of mature and you go through that process, you do want to develop your own style. And when I started making music, it was just an urge. I didn't know why, I didn't overthink it, but I knew it was something I had to explore. I really think music was the way that I could hear my own voice amongst a lot of loud voices around me. That's how you get to know yourself, by making the music and you listen to it and you go, oh. That combined with this creative freedom where you can say anything and you can sing anything and no one is gonna tell you that it's wrong. Songwriting is so strange because you never know if you're going to write something that's good or bad. Certain things you can learn to know that you'll have a certain level of, you know, quality at the end. But in terms of a really good song, that doesn't always happen. You're rolling the dice every time and you can practice and practice to be good at it, but you just have no idea what you're going to end up with at the end of the day. That keeps this magical process incredibly exciting. At a certain point, there is this synthesis that happens. All of these elements have to kind of combine like clockwork. The music and the rhythm and the melody and the words all have to come at once and land in a spot. When a great song happens, somehow it's alive. And it feels real and it rests in itself. It's not trying. There's an honesty about it. There's an authenticity about it. And it moves you. Antibodies reminds me of a time where I got to experience a lot of fun stuff in LA. When you claim the city in a way, you discover great places you haven't seen before. It really stands for this energy, you know, like this exciting, positive feel. 
at that point I also thought I, I was gonna live there probably forever, you know, the, the plan was to stay in LA. I had a great time, I was really happy. Antibodies was the first of the final three tracks to be added to the album that Armada brought to us. I definitely will never forget the day that we got that top line and listened to it and we were all just blown away by it. You know, the first thing I thought when I heard it was Michael Jackson and like to the point where you're like, wow, that sounds like that's Michael Jackson singing. I don't need pills, don't need a drug. You're the perfect remedy with a single touch. What Kara did with this song is incredible. She brought such a good energy to the table and it's such a good fit. I feel it rushing through my veins, yeah. Take me all the way. Antibodies, no chemicals, they're supernatural our bodies. It's just what we need. The title came first, just the word, and then the melody. Ten Snake just created his own pop funk style. There are a lot of influences in there. If you listen to the bass line, it reminds me of some French house productions from the 90s. But the main focus was really to go for some uplifting, very positive disco vibe. He understood what this song was about and what it's supposed to be. It's a very uplifting, sunny, energy and that's also a big part of my LA experience and I'm so happy that the song is on the album. Strange Without You was a really fun one to work on because it actually started out as a Marco and Fiora song and then they found this guy in Miami, Daramola, who I think just completely changed the vibe of the song in a very good way. There's a very sort of tropical Caribbean rhythm and sound to his voice. I was like, wow, this is crazy. It's completely different where I wanted to go with this song, but I was like, okay, this could actually work. And so I'll typically do all my top line, but for this song, the melody was written by Fiora and Ten Snake. What a lot of writers fail to reference or acknowledge is the fact that certain things are singable depending on how you sing or the way you word things. And I think just melodically and just lyrically, it was just perfect. In my case, it was in the sound. In his case, it was in what I was saying and how my voice sat in the vocals. And I think in just piecing that together, it made for just the magic of, of the record. In a sense, the pain is the melody and where the song takes you. But knowing that you were willing to do everything for it and knowing that it's just not gonna happen. Strange Without You was for me a little bit more difficult, I think, because it was one of those moments in the studio where the lyrics came out and it was like, okay, there's no hiding from the truth of this moment. When I started working on Strange Without You, I worked with Fiora on, on the backing track and we were just having fun, you know, writing music and we were still together. 
And I remember the first part that we had was the chorus. After I wrote the chorus, I sent my vocals to Marco and then our relationship really took a turn and there was a lot of evolution in that. We were having a difficult time and I didn't know if we would get through it and it didn't mean to be like a future projection, but that's what I was going through. I just wasn't sure if I could stick this thing out. So it's not like I think to myself, I want to write a song about how weird it is now that we're not together at all. It just comes like with the melody and the words all at once. Then I think I didn't work on it for a while. And when we broke up, it didn't feel right to work on the song together anymore. I had to adapt and make a decision, you know, for my life. Strange Without You really contains a moment of my life where I realize that I probably won't stay in LA. It really stands for that time when we broke up and it's two different pieces and I felt like, okay, my time here is over. It has been kind of strange without you Even though we both know how we are And for all I thought about you And I really think you can hear that in the song. Girl, you know your love is everything oh. The way you make me feel, it feel like bling, oh. Initially, I had the idea to translate my journey in LA into the music videos as well. So we have this trilogy of videos. They are all connected. They are telling a story. So in a way, again, it's a diary. No había trabajado con él, no lo había conocido personalmente, pero conocí a Ten Snake como como el artista, no había escuchado su música. Eh, sí, sí lo tenía yo de que consciente. Quién era cuando John, que es mi video commissioner en, en Londres, me mandó el, la propuesta. Yo me emocioné mucho, neta, y a mí lo que me mandaron fue como que el riff de lo que Ten Snake quería, que él se basó el álbum, cuando hizo el álbum lo, se basó en Los Ángeles, de el tiempo que pasó allá, eh, y así, y me mandó los tres tracks que quería que sean video, y creen que fuera una historia continua. Eh, bueno, en, en Somebody Else, es que fue extraño, para empezar me, me conecté mucho con la lírica, eh, creo yo justo acaba de pasar por un proceso así medio similar. I spent a lot of time in Venice when I uh, I was staying in LA, and I usually go in the morning and just to be in the beach and watch the, uh, the sea and the, and the waves. And I remember a lot of this image of a girl uh, coming out of the water, and she start running to the sand and start kissing her partner. And she kisses so hard that she kind of fell to the floor and just start kind of going volcanoes in the arena. And that kind of like image stuck with me and I remember that I pictured that in my head while I was listening to somebody else. And I think that's how the whole idea of the project started coming together from that specific shot. Somebody else is turning out the lights Last time we 
Creo que para mí Los Ángeles se convirtió en una... Es una ciudad como muy... Creo colorida. Creo que tienes un poco de todo en la ciudad. Creo que hay muchas personas y que toda la energía de las personas y el arte se crea una vibra que cuando estás en el ley es like an open world for artistas. En la segunda one es Strength Without You. I try to put more uh, little pieces of this kind of like fantasy that we just have a little glimpse at the end of somebody else. It was really challenging for me because I never act before. I really want to do this to expand my skills and also like connect with, with the audience with only my eyes. I want them to feel what the human was feeling in that moment, you know? In a way, we thought it would be a great idea to pick up, you know, this kind of playing with the Disney story, the mermaid, of course, you know, Hollywood, LA, Disney, but it's kind of a modern version, you know?
my brain You want me, you make me go insane But I can't be your miracle for life Yeah, yeah Let me give you something you can stand on Don't be saying you just need fun like you know what now I'm drowning in your love and it's so real Dos, eh, si, tiene, si tienen un ritmo porque mi idea era como que fuera avanzando que la transición de los videos se fuera subiendo en cuestión del surrealismo el dream like it's a fairy tale it's fantasy everybody experienced this in his life uh, you, you, you meet someone you fall in love it's difficult you know maybe you can't be together but you know screw it, you make a decision and you want to be together and you just make it happen. So I was trying to be loyal to the music and the lyrics at the same time of creating this story that will like, kind of like match or work together with the different uh, story that is going to happen in Strength Without You and make you mine.
La experiencia chida con, con Marco Densnake, eh, creo que para mí fue que él me dio la libertad creativa de usar su material a como yo sentía que para mí. Me dio un brief que sí que respetar, pero no me dio ninguna de las bases que tiene que ser de esto. Eso. Yo creo que cuando tú trabajas en algo por mucho tiempo, como en este caso con un álbum que eres tú, y te da, te da la libertad creativa a alguien de esto es lo que quiero, esto es lo que para mí me hace sentir, tú qué sientes y vamos a ver si funciona. Creo que respeto mucho porque ese es un respeto que se da entre artistas. Y especialmente para alguien como Tesnay, que yo ya lo conocía y, ya, y pues ya era fan de, de su música. Eh, estuvo chido que él me diera esa puerta abierta a ver cómo yo le presentaba lo que él sintió en el, en el video. ¿no? Again, we have a magical story, you know, it's kind of also how I felt about the city. It, it still is for me one of the most magical places in the world. And um, yeah, I think um, we did a great job. Like I love the videos and you have this love story in there. It's basically also how LA is. It's LA is somehow corny, but also it's great. And it's when you look behind it, it's it's rough, you know. And it's everything is in there. It's magical. It's um, sadness. It's um, joy. You know, possibilities, difficult stuff. It's all in there. At this moment on my journey in LA, I realized I wasn't sure if I would want to stay. I had to think about the pro and cons of staying and basically make a new start, build a new life, or maybe go back to my old life. So it was a really rough time because the plan was really to stay. On your own, LA can be a big challenge. It can also be the loneliest and darkest place. Overnight is probably my kind of indie pop song on the whole album. I was listening a lot to the band Haim from LA. I think that influenced me a lot when I worked on, on this song. I remember when I worked on the instrumental, Fiora heard it and she was, you know, singing over the, the chorus part and then she was adding those harmonies. The song felt very natural for Fiora, so from the get-go, she took over the, the production pretty much. I'm personally very connected to Overnight. At that time, I just been speaking to a friend of mine, and I just noticed these kind of patterns emerging in our conversations. And she was going through the difficult end of Los Angeles, you know, where LA really gets you down and stuff isn't working. I wanted to sort of give that to my friend, maybe give it to myself at the same time, remind her that, that things could change. There would be hope on the horizon, I suppose. So that really became the inspiration behind Overnight for me. She put so much feel and energy into it that she really took the lead there. And for Overnight, I really felt, okay, she knows what she's doing, let her do her stuff. And um, I think it's great. Overnight is really about coming to realize that you have a conscious choice in your life and you can change your own patterns. You have a lot more control than you think sometimes when stuff's coming at you. So Overnight's really about looking to yourself to empower yourself to change your life.
Adam's Hill is the last song on my album and also really one of my favorites and most personal songs on the album. It's a very timeless song for me and it carries a lot of emotion even though there are no vocals. There's not a lot of instrumental tracks on this album, but I think that it was important that there be some, and this one really conveys the most emotion, I think, through just simply being an instrumental and not even needing lyrics to convey what he's trying to say with this song. Fiora and Marco, they had broken up. But then they got back together and then they moved to this place in Adams Hill and they set up a studio. You know, they were trying to make it work again and they were trying to recapture their L.A. dream. So we wrote a bunch of stuff in that phase and then our relationship properly ended. And so we didn't write any more after that. And it was really difficult. I drove up to see Marco, checking on him, see how he was doing. And I just remember going into that house. And I just remember Marco kind of, you know, just being really sad. And I think that was the first point he said, I think I'm, it's time for me to go back home. At that moment in time, I remember talking to my manager, Ryan. He tried to convince me, don't leave, stay in LA, you know. I thought about it, but uh, at that time, it was clear for me, um, I had to leave. So in a way, um, Adam Sill is a very uh, bittersweet song. There's sadness in there, but there's also hope in there. Um, it was sort of his swan song, his way of saying, you know, goodbye and it's been fun, but it's time for me to go home now. The last song on my album, it only made sense. Looking back, I'm really proud of, of the album. I think my album LA really reflects my life in, in Los Angeles, you know, with all its struggles and great moments. I think you can hear that in its diversity. It can be good and bad, you know. It is what it is. It's, it's what happened to me and that's my musical journal. All songs represent where you're at at that moment in time as a writer and definitely the songs on the record speak to where I was at um, in my relationship with Los Angeles, in my relationship with Marco, my relationship with myself. There's actually quite a beautiful synergy on how we both grew musically through being in Los Angeles. LA is not a place that you go to and remain unchanged. It is a place where it's gonna test you, but you're gonna to get to know yourself in a different way. And that's always amazing. I'm really thankful for all the collaborators and for the many great people who were involved in realizing the album. Without them, it wouldn't be the same. And now I'm really excited for the next chapter. It's gonna be the remix album called L.A. Noir. I don't think he's given up on the dream though. I think maybe there's something about L.A. from Marco that he gives me the impression that he'll come back at some point. <laughs>